Time now to talk about a new review on frailty in elderly people and here with me is Dr Andrew Clegg who is clinical senior lecturer at the University of Leeds and also consultant geriatrician at Bradford Royal Infirmary. Hello to you. Hello. Now first of all can you explain frailty and which age groups are affected? Frailty is, uh, is a condition that affects older people uh, and it develops really as a, as a consequence of this age-accelerated uh, decline in many uh, organ, si organ systems of the body, uh, which collectively results in this vulnerability to what we call poor resolution of homeostasis after a stressor event. Put simply, what this means is that frail older people uh, are at risk of major changes in health following relatively minor illnesses. For example, a frail older person who develops a, a relatively minor infection, such as a chest infection, or your in infection would be vulnerable uh, to a, a sudden and disproportionate change in their health that's oft often manifests as moving from being independent to dependent, from lucid to delirious, or from being mobile to either being immobile or falling. Now if we're talking about organs in the body, which are the most commonly affected and which of those is the most dangerous for the patient? The brain, the endocrine or hormone system, uh, the immune system and skeletal muscle are the organ systems currently best studied uh, in frailty. Now what are the frailty models and how reliable are they? Well, so there's two principal models of frailty, the phenotype model and the cumulative deficit model. Uh, both models have been extensively validated in large epidemiological studies and they're both very, very reliable uh, for the identification of frailty. And interestingly, if you, if you compare both models, um, so if you measure uh, frailty using both models uh, in a group of people, when you actually compare both groups, um, you seem to identify a lot of, lot of the same people, which, which, which tends to lend support for recognition of frailty more as a unified construct. Now, which of the currently available tools do you think have been proven to be most effective for clinicians in the assessment of frailty, and also which will improve health outcomes in a sensible follow-up time? The internationally established method uh, of assessing older people um, is what we call comprehensive geriatric assessment and that's really specialist uh, elderly care that, that identifies an older person's medical, functional, psychological and social uh, needs to develop a, a treatment plan uh, and a follow-up plan. Now, uh, this assessment is usually led by uh, a geriatrician alongside well, specialist elderly nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. Uh, but this, this form of assessment has been, has been proven um, to be a good measure of frailty and allows you to categorise frailty uh, and to predict outcomes. It's a, it's a very sensitive and strong predictor of outcomes. Uh, alongside that method of identifying uh, frailty, there are other well, simple questionnaires. There's a range of simple questionnaires available um, to assess for frailty and some, some quite simple um, assessment tools. So things like um, grip strength, tests of mobility, um, they're simple tests that we can use in, in everyday clinical practice that are likely to, to identify frailty. There's still work to be done to demonstrate that they're valid in all populations, but they're, they're simple assessments that have um, good, good, good face value uh, for identifying uh, frailty. Now once you have assessed patients, what are the interventions which really are effective in reducing the severity of frailty? There's a robust evidence base for comprehensive geriatric assessment or specialist elderly care. So a comprehensive geriatric assessment delivered to um, older people in hospital on an elderly care ward uh, results in, in better outcomes when you compare um, when you compare people on, on general medical wards. Uh, alongside that, there's, there's evidence that exercise interventions can improve outcomes, but we're still uncertain about the intensity of exercise and also uh, whether um, benefit is achieved across the spectrum of frailty. Uh, there are also um, a small number of drug trials of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and vitamin D. Uh, these, these drugs require further investigation, really, in, in larger clinical, clinical trials before they'll become part of usual care. And there are different stages of frailty, are there? And what do these mean in terms of morbidity and mortality? The best way to look at frailty is really on a spectrum of severity. So from people who are, are fit, older people who are fit, right through to older people who are severely frail. Uh, and now the prevalence uh, of frailty increases with age. Um, and usually, um, usually once someone has become frail, they gradually become more frail over time. Not always, but usually. 
Um, and for example, in the over 65 population, around about 10% of people would be measurably frail, and that increases over time to, say, in the over 85 uh, population, between a quarter uh, and a half of all people would, would be frail. Um, this obviously has implications because we know that, that frailty is independently associated with adverse outcomes, so falls, disability, delirium, admission to hospital, admission to, to care home residence, so nursing residential home. Uh, and we know that these adverse outcomes uh, are expensive, so it's, it's, helpful, it's helpful to consider the, the implications of frailty on a, on a global scale. And uh, we know that population ageing worldwide is increasing from around 500 million people over the age of 65 currently uh, to an estimated 2 billion people by 2050. Uh, we also know that uh, older people in general, but frail older people in particular, are the core users of, of health and social care services. So um, account for um, approximately 50% 50, 50 of total hospital bed days in the UK, across Europe, in North America. And in the UK, uh, account for um, around 50% of all adult social care spending. So it's only when you begin to, well, to, to, to consider these figures on a global level that you real, realise the profound implications of frailty. Now what have you found about what can halt uh, the development of frailty? One question would be, is it possible to avoid the development of frailty? And I think at the moment um, that's, a, that's a question that it's difficult to answer with certainty. Part of the difficulty is that we're not sure when exactly to intervene. Um, to try and avoid frailty? Is it when people are, are younger and fit? Is it when people are older but still fit? Or is it when people are just beginning to show signs of frailty? Uh, at the moment that's, that's really an area of ongoing and, and future research. Um, equally, equally, if not more important, um, we need to better understand if there's a level of frailty, a severity of frail beyond, frailty beyond which um, the risk of harm through treatments and interventions actually begins to outweigh benefit. And that would actually inform us um, to, to look at more of a holistic um, care for frail older people um, as opposed to well, maybe a focus um, on currently on, on treatment. So move away from this focus on treatment more to quality of life for frail older people with, with severe frailty. Now what kind of resources are needed for that kind of care and how do we convince health authorities to pay for it? The important thing to first consider is that we're um, that a significant proportion uh, of current health and social care expenditure is spent on frailty but it's not immediately evident to health and social care commissioners and providers and this is because we see the cost of the consequences of frailty so falls, delirium, disability and older age. Uh, and what we need to what we need to do really is, is is shift away from counting the cost of the consequences of frailty and move resources uh, more towards the prevention and treatment of frailty uh, to do that we need to do two things first of all we need to uh, identify frail older people as part of routine care and we need to develop a more robust evidence base for interventions to improve outcomes now you sort of left a few questions unanswered, so what do you think are the future research priorities in this field? Well given the profound implications of, of frailty uh, at a global level for, well, for, for modern health and social care systems, I think it's worth considering whether frailty as a, as a condition should be a research priority. I think within frailty we need, uh, we need further basic science research to better understand the the mechanisms of frailty to identify targets for treatment. We need further applied health research to develop and evaluate interventions to improve outcomes. Uh, we need investigations of, of methods of assessing uh, frailty as part of routine care. Uh, we need clinical trials of drugs uh, for treatment and prevention of frailty. Uh, and we need health economic studies uh, to, to more confidently uh, assess the, the, the health economic implications of frailty. And I think, arguably, all these, all these areas of research are priorities um, because frailty well, it does, it has such profound implications for such a vulnerable uh, a group of modern society. Well, Dr Andrew Clegg, thank you very much. Thank you very much.